So uh, this week I've been trying to integrate the polyphase block into the ADI reference design without much luck. I've been, uh, the first thing I fixed, what I think are all the typos in the design. Um, typos where? In the wrapper. But uh, still trying to, uh, I've been reading the manual and uh, trying different angles. There's there's a number of different ways you can go about it. One is like adding a, a module, I guess is the sim supposedly the simplest way. Um, and there's packaging it up in, as an IP. I think I've, I, I successfully made it a package at one point, I have it off sitting on the side here, but now it's, it's like, how do I get that block um, actually dragged into the top level? I'm having trouble getting both designs uh, up at the same time. So that's just keep uh, futzing with it. So I'll go back and reread re the manual. I've done that a couple times, but I think I'm missing something. So that's about all I have. Okay, that's a pretty succinct summary. That's a, a familiar problem. Um, I've had had issues in the past with trying to accomplish this on you know, in Vivado. Um, so, so I'll, I'll hope where I can. In terms of like the the actual um, technical part of the design, like what it's accomplishing, is there anything that you're missing, or is there any sort of confusion about like the math or the 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 structure, what you're delivering. I know you helped me out with um with letting me know what I was gonna get uh on the receiver side for the for the demodulation. So it's it's familiar. And I think I have the interfaces set up ready uh for the for the receiver functions. Um but is there anything else that's confusing or or that you you have trouble with? Whoops. I think there there will be issues once we get it up in a sim. Uh, right now it's compiling clean as far as I could tell. And I think we got the interfaces nailed in terms of the async and the, there was an issue going between the streaming and the, um, AXI light. I got that fixed. Um, that's all from a couple weeks back, but just the block itself, I feel pretty good about, uh, but yeah, until we actually get it integrated and, and up and running in a sim. Tough tough to say. So did any of the examples from analog devices help you in any way from that page that we found? Um I've mostly been using the the Xilinx integrate IP documentation. Okay. I the uh, I think the previous week when I was trying to work off the tickle stuff, I was looking at more of the ADI because there's certain macros that are custom to that environment. But uh, right now I'm just trying to do the like get the block design and then like actually just really just drag the the new block into the design and stitch it up and then somehow translate that to a tickle command. That was what I was it what I've been. That's that's my goal right now, because <laughs> I was having trouble with the, uh, you know, just doing it, slinging tickle, tickle around using the ADI commands. It didn't seem to want to recognize the block. And in fact, I'm seeing something. It's kind of weird. I'm seeing something similar when I try and drag the blocks. It says you can't. It's not a valid IP. So if there's there's some sort of flag or something on the block that is keeping it from. Like I can actually start to drag it into the design, but then it says the, the you can't do it for this IP. It's like grayed out if you try and do it manually. Okay, that's so. a big clue. That That's helpful. It sounds like you've gotten really far. No, not really, but <laughs> I'll keep trying. Yeah. It always feels like it's not very far when you're not there yet. Okay, cool. No, thank you. Is there anything else uh, that you have questions about or need help with? Not right now. Thank you, though. Yeah, sure thing. Looking forward to this working. Uh, so on Opulent Voice, which is our uh, uplink receiver, uh, so so Ken's working on the polyphase filter bank or polyphase channelizer implementation on the transponder, so on the spacecraft. And what uh, 
what I've been digging into is uh, picking up where uh, the University of Puerto Rico left off with the uh, using opulent voice uh, as a link. Uh, so taking the specification, taking the work uh, done so far on a general purpose processor side, and then trying to bring that into to Simulink to get some simulations and to check things. And I found something interesting. So there was these um, unexpected discontinuities in in our waveform. Um, and I was like, well, that shouldn't happen because this is a minimum frequency shift keying system and we thought we did the math okay and we have all this laid out and getting a visualization of waveforms in the time domain is really helpful uh, occasionally. Like a lot of people just skip right over, they go straight to the frequency domain and stay there. But, you know, at least speaking for myself, it's always, I always find it really helpful and reassuring to see it in the time domain. And when I see these discontinuities that happened half the time, uh, those shouldn't happen. And I went back and everything seemed fine. I, I looked at all the papers that we had been using and the, the textbooks that we'd been using and the YouTube videos that we'd been using and everything worked out. And then I dug out one of the, my go-to books from Earl McCune. Uh, it was a, he used to be a friend of mine from uh, MTTS, uh, IEEE. He unfortunately, has passed away. Uh, too young, I would say. Uh, so I, I still miss him. Uh, but his book, Practical Digital Systems Book, um, and I just, just on a lark, took it with me this weekend, and I read through the the section on FSK. And he always spoke and wrote in a very clear, kind of pragmatic way. And I learned something. I've been doing it wrong. Um, a lot of people <laughs> do it wrong. This is a frequent source of confusion for uh, between FM, frequency modulation, and FSK, frequency shift keying. Um, the modulation index calculations are not the same, except for binary FSK. So binary FSK and frequency modulation, those, those modulation index is the same. But once you go up to a higher order, it's not the same. And we're at four, not two. So we use four tones instead of two. We fall into this category and we're seeing exactly what we should see um, erroneously using a, a single-sided uh, view of of our tones rather than a two-sided view of the tones. So in, in frequency modulation, you do have a, a, a carrier or a central frequency. You Your modulation index is calculated from that. But in FSK, it's two-sided. So once that adjustment was made, which does increase our occupied bandwidth, uh, but it's still within the the scheme that we have um, for for what you're doing, Ken. Uh, but once we did that, all the discontinuities went away. The baseband waveform looks perfect. Everything is good. And uh, Earl's very clear. You know, this is a source of confusion, and you. You know, it, this this trips up lots of people. Uh, really, kind of leaped out of the page to me. Um, so we we learned a bit, and maybe we can we can make it uh, more clear for other people out there. Um, and so, just to just to let you know about how widespread this is, I've I I have in our collection like three or four uh, PhD dissertations about FSK that have this misunderstanding baked in. Um, and as Earl points out, most people say, okay, here you go, you get your original, you get your deviation that you need. And for minimum frequency shift keying, it's half the symbol rate. You take your symbol rate, half the symbol rate, that's your deviation. And you just add tones. You just expand out for higher order, but you have to get the original separation correct. So the single-sided versus double-sided, you know, deviation or two times the deviation, that that's that seems to be important. Um, so we'll keep reviewing this to make sure that we have it right still. You know, like, you know, it was a, a a big step forward and cleared up some misunderstandings that we had. And we'll keep working to make sure that we really do understand it and get all the math right. And then uh, try to document this in as clear a way and as findable a way as we can. Um, so this is a, a good a good thing. Um, and so that was that was an improvement over this past weekend. And there was um, 
what I did is I implemented a, a test bench so that we have a transmitter for opulent voice tones in Simulink that can be turned into HDL. So that now we have a, uh, a transmitter, you know, transmitting tones into what is essentially a receiver for opulent voice. Uh, so far I have um, receiver uh, NCOs that work correctly. So figured that out. It was confusing as to how you set up the NCO and how it was picking up a sampling, essentially a sampling rate. Figured that out last week, got that working. Um, and the the CIC, which is a, a, a type of integrating, uh, like a comb filter, the first stage uh, of the receiver is is in there. And so far, the visualizations look okay. So there's still multiple stages to bring it down to essentially baseband um, in in the receiver side. So the receiver's not done, but lots of progress and and uh, uh, good things going on. So that's that's the report on my end. So lots of lots of good things, um, and and still uh, things lots of things to to document cleanly and clearly. So the the design itself uh, can speak for itself in some ways, especially when it's uh, working over the air. But uh, I'm actually looking forward to Friday or documentation day to where I'll sit down and and summarize this. Uh, as clearly and cleanly and as accessible as possible. So I'm looking forward to to interfacing this work with yours, Ken. Um, and the AXI stream interface should be the only thing, um, you know. And and what we're relying on is a 32 bits. So the I and the Q, I is 16, Q is 16 bits, one word. That's how the DVBS2 encoder works as well. So I'm just going to assume that and set that up in the code. And uh, as speaking as a uh, optimist, it should just work. <laughs> what I've done for okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm assuming um, the 245.76 megahertz rate from the receiver. So that's what we have on the 9009. And I think that what you're doing, your channelization is going to knock down that rate. I think divided divided by 64. Yeah. OK. I mean, basically, is the filter can output all 64. I mean, it's a filter with an FFT channelization on it. So um, it can output all 64, or you can sub-select any, any set of that, including just a single one. So it sounds like it'll work. So maybe overkill, but I don't know of an alternate way to get what you need. So okay. So what I'll do is I'll assume that I don't have any channelization. I'm assuming full IQ rate. And then I might be able to do some experiments with, with that uh in the meantime. But like it looks like if I can get a single channel from you that I can assume a lower rate and some of the chain of the receiver that I'm designing will then go away. It can be, it can be left out. Okay. Yeah. I'll try to mark it very cleanly. Like, okay, you know, no, no channelizer, <laughs> you know, full fire hose, you know, uh, and then, oh, with the channelizer, now we have this t essentially 256, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, 250 kilohertz sample rate channel, like, and my signal is somewhere in here, and now I have to go find it. Uh, and I'm also starting out with assuming that it's, that the tracking is, is, uh, is done. I'm not trying to add that yet. Um, there are a lot of things that the receiver side can do in terms of like, at least like pointing, if there is any pointing issues, um, you know, but assuming a signal that I know a, pretty much where it is and Doppler is not going to be too challenging, then that that's where I'm kind of starting. Um, yeah, should within a week, I should have more more of this done. Uh, actively looking for other folks to to include and to to take on parts of it. Um, yeah, but but good stuff. Cool. 
All right. And uh, and thank you, thank you, Matthew. I see Matthew. Is there is there anything that you'd like to to say or uh, uh, well, uh, comment on? Uh, but I was wondering, like, I'd like to maybe help out a little bit here. Um, so I, I, is there a list of tasks or a Trello for the Opulent Voice or anything that, in particular that um, needs some attention? Yeah, there is. Um, at this point, it's probably a good idea to split off the, the Opulent Voice stuff. It could, it could deserve its own, probably its own board. Um, so let me, I was just thinking about that at the end of last week. I was like, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, there's tasks that are sprinkled around in our main ORI mm -hmm. board. Um, but it might, it, it need, probably needs its own, own columns at the very least. Um, so yeah, let me go ahead and take that as an action item and, and make, make it a little more visible. So, uh, and also what I've, the work that I, that I've been doing um, on MATLAB is only on the MAT account over on Karabi. Uh So it needs to it needs to find a home somewhere. But so it's a repository that people can check out and then duplicate on the mm -hmm. VMs like we are doing with Neptune. So Neptune's working pretty well that we have a, a updated repo and a checkout process that you can get to the work. Um, and so far, the only opulent voice repository that's really easy to find is the one for the general purpose processor for the Raspberry Pi for, for that setup. Uh, so the work that we're talking about doing for the FPGA is just sitting on Karapi and not really, um, not as easy easy to get to or, or, you know, you can't just go clone it. So that needs to be fixed and I'll, I'll work on that um, first. Because I think we have enough to show and enough working that uh, that definitely needs to be <laughs> documented better. So I'll do that. So yeah, tasks and tasks plus a uh, better repo. And then I've asked, uh, I know that we have an opportunity to fly this with the University of Puerto Rico. They, um, the, the version that was on a like the the general purpose processor version, the C modem was made available. And also uh, there was some development from the University of Puerto Rico rocket uh, team. So they participate in the, the launch, uh, sounding rocket launch at Wallops. And it flew, but their rocket had major issues. So there was a failure of the rocket. Um, and the neat thing is that the, the, university had a, a, a recorder so they they recorded a lot of data from this flight and nasa is working with their data to figure out what happened uh, so that team is getting a lot of very educational experiences with this uh, mission and the upside at least for us is that they've been offered a sure bet on the next round so usually universities have to um apply and and go through an application process and and submit all of their plans and and it's a selection it's very competitive uh university of puerto rico is a frequent frequent flyer because their program's really good um but in order to kind of make up for the fact that their science mission which is very cool it samples um mid to high level of the atmosphere for or biological stuff. So, so this is a really cool system. The, the sounding rocket goes way up. Once it gets to a particular altitude, it opens and it sends out like a, a what is that? A, some sort of aerogel thing that captures particles and it's all sterile and then retracts back. So it samples the, a part of the atmosphere that we really don't know a lot about. And the communications was opulent voice. Um, so they get to do this again. They they get another flight. Uh, so we have another opportunity uh, to to put together communication support uh, for that. Um, so we're looking forward to that. That'll be good. Uh, so I don't know about the schedule though. So I've asked the uh, the instructor uh, Oscar Resto at uh, and and he I'll I'll ping him a couple of times to make sure that we're fitting in with their with their new schedule with this kind of not really a delayed launch, but a retry. 
and to see if we can't, uh, you know, tighten things up and make it make it serve them even better than than the last go around. I'm I'm presuming that they're going to fly the same uh, science mission, but who knows? They might they might do that plus something else. They still had room. They allocated so much room on the rocket and so much power, and they came in kind of under budget. So who knows? They might have more to to pack it package up in in the uh, in the communications link. So that'll be that'll be fun. Uh, so I'll I'll see if I'll see if I can't get the schedule back from from Oscar and the students. So is that a, a CubeSat? Or is it something that would remain in orbit, or is it just a um... Kind of up and down type flight it's the latter it's a sounding rocket so it goes up and you can get up to like 15 minutes in in space uh but it is definitely an up and comes back down uh sort of program uh very very popular with with universities and um it, it, it does give you a lot of good information and is considered to be a pretty good leverage point or pivot point to to things like CubeSats or or higher orbit work. Uh, in the case of University of Puerto Rico, they've done all sorts of different things. Um, but not usually it's the science payload that they concentrate on. So some sort of atmospheric or altitude based or rocket based science. Uh, and the communications part has never been the primary part for them. So partnering with them has brought here, here's some cool communications capabilities that you, so we get an opportunity to go on a sounding rocket and they get uh, enhanced communications. Uh, and all of our interactions with, with uh, Wallops and University have been, been excellent. Um, originally we proposed to work at like 900 megahertz uh, and we got a lot of feedback about that. Uh, they, they wanted us to stay away from about one gig. So they have lots of equipment, uh, I think, at, involved with the rockets and the launches that so they were very happy to move us away to uh to 400 megahertz so 70 centimeters uh and so we have a couple of antennas for that for designed for rockets so these sort of blade antennas low profile that'll work uh, so we have a couple of those in stock uh university of puerto rico has one and we have one additional one here that was for another project that did not uh, get off the ground so, so we're good on the RF hardware side, at least for for antennas off of the satellite, and we're we're in the right a band that uh, that NASA is happy with, uh, and NASA was really interested in our in our project and and thought that our our goals for Opulent Voice were, were really pretty cool, and uh, so we've gotten some some support and uh, some thumbs up there. So looking forward to that. It was. Definitely a bummer for the students that had a failed launch. Um, and some of those students will not get to experience the relaunch because they've graduated. Um, you know, but for for us, it's a it's a really nice opportunity to get an additional year to, to help develop and to provide something and to communicate with the with the group. Where's the launch at? Uh, Wallops is uh, is where the it's rocks, rocks at, uh, or yeah, the rocks at project. So, so the the launches that uh, that are in this program are from Wallops, and we we were invited. Like we can go. Um, we we would have to kind of like coordinate with the school. So for anybody that helps the students, there's at least a little bit of funding for travel. We'd probably have to cut, scrape up some some funding ourselves, but. Um, you know the launch is open for for collaborators, uh, which is is pretty neat. These are these are cool launches with the they're bigger than a model rocket, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, and they the the video that we've seen because University of Puerto Rico has had a camera on board a couple of times, and wow, you know when there's no humans on board a rocket, they just they spin and it's pretty pretty remarkable. It looks uh. It looks like it's going really, really fast, and it is. So that's a. Uh, it's always fun. Is there any um, documentation on what the, what that you know, rather than just asking questions here, but on how they're using Opulent Voice? I mean, uh, since are they using it for the science package for communicating 
collected data back or is yes it yeah it was a backup like they were like okay so what we're going to do is use this as telemetry like we're going to stream back data just in case something happened you know and and that's that's what the students are supposed to kind of start anticipating as as designing a system uh, for space is that you know a lot of these um, experiments like for sounding rockets they go up they come down you recover them and you get the data back and they're like okay well what if that doesn't happen so that's that's kind of a standing sort of question from from like nasa or any other uh entity uh that would be wanting you to design a system that's that's a legit question like okay what if something catastrophic happened on the way up or down like or you could not get you couldn't recover your your you know your data logger and so opulent voice was the sort of the pick it was like okay we'll just stream it back and record it and then we have everything and yeah. we also have the 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 actual payload with all the stuff recorded sure um and there so, were I mean, the, the the um just my, for my own edification so i mean you're, we're not really using the codec here then it's more just the mm -mm. The, the data link part of opulent voice yeah correct yes we're using the the it as you know the essentially the data mode it's just as a as a pipe yeah not using not using codec for voice unless one of the students wanted to i mean we told them go nuts you know we'll we'll support you in whatever whatever you want uh to do uh, but in this case yeah it was just to transmit data very good thank you oh sure no it's a good project um and we we had another, there was another sounding rocket that we were part of, a uh, commercial project uh, that actually was supporting student, student work as well. Uh, that got delayed and delayed and delayed. And and now it does not look like it's it's going to go up, but I'm still in touch with the uh, the company and the, the principal person that wanted to do it. So we may have another, uh, another opportunity um, and we're we're looking around for for anyone else. Uh, and I, last week I I went to the Virginia Tech um, sp Space Industry Advisory Board meeting. We're a member of that that group, and I'm always looking for opportunities to kind of support students with open source development work. Like it's it's a really good way to learn, and it looks like there's a number of 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 places. There's a number of things where where things like Opulent Voice can fit in. Um, when in, in dealing with VT's Virginia Tech space program, though, uh, their expectation is, is more of like a commercial interface. So if you have a completed product that we can integrate into the student experience and much less student development, like the students aren't going to, are going to help develop it, but they will use it and integrate it into a, a larger craft. Uh, so okay. you can clearly see like the different approaches different universities have um and and the size of the program has a lot to do with it vt has a uh, well-known pretty large aerospace and their engineering uh and computing department are big and have been involved in in rockets and space and and payloads for a while um so you can you can you can sort of see um they have different expectations and and you know Sort of like oh you know as an organization they they are expecting you to behave more like a commercial product way rather than a collaborative engineering development way so, so. I mean, would we, it seems like we could meet a lot of those needs like you know with the underlying technology or even having a, a space ready package yeah that's the goal is that if we had something and we're close in in a lot of ways uh some some parts of the some parts of our development are further away than others. Uh, you know, I would say like our the open source propulsion is pretty pretty low TRL still. You know, even well, though it's I guess I'm just thinking in terms of like the communications. Yeah, system, right? yeah, that, communication uh, stuff. We're getting we're getting to the point where it's a package. Like here you go, download this, deploy it here, make you know, integrate. Even have some hardware that you could provide if they wanted, right? Yes, uh, that that's definitely the goal. Is uh, here's a board, here's a here's a one U set of cards, ready to go. Here's how you use it. That's 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 going to be deeply appreciated. We get a lot of feedback on that. 
So we're, we're getting closer and closer towards that, like the work Ken is doing and uh, the work that Swato has done um, in order to get there and, and then turn a, turn a card, test it, and then provide it. That would be that we, we would get a lot of traction with that. Mm -hmm. So fun stuff. All right. Hey, Paul, any, any updates or, or questions or comments? Hi. Um, no, no, no updates today. I'm just uh, up here working with contractors and getting my house fixed up. So. Oh, well, good luck you with know, that. I'll be in and out. Okay. No, I think we're good. All right. So I'll get back to the lab and back to Slack. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, for helping out uh, for the remote lab over the past week. Uh, it's been uh, well used <laughs> and working. So de definitely appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Ken, any last any last comments or requests or anything? No. Bye-bye. All right. See you all soon. All right. Thanks.